everyone should have, or almost everyone should have a power of attorney, and I'll explain that. Everyone should have a healthcare proxy, and a living will is certainly an important document that goes hand in hand with the healthcare proxy. So the topic today is trusts, but I do have to talk about some of these other documents and how they relate to each other. So I'm gonna start off with the last will and testament. So most people know that a will is a legal document and it's a, 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 it has to be signed in a very specific way. The law says it's signed a certain way, the, the, uh, it should be drafted a certain way, certain provisions should be in it, the individual who signs it has to have capacity, and all of this is very, very important. But why are we talking about wills when the topic would be trusts? So let me step back for a moment and, and tell you how this all relates. Uh, I assume everybody knows what a trust is. A trust is a legal entity that actually holds assets. Some people might say it's like a, uh, an envelope, in a sense, that holds assets and the assets are managed and distributed in accordance with the terms of the trust agreement. So the trust holds these assets. And there are three main people involved within a trust. It's the grantor, G A. G-R-A-N-T-O-R, or settlor, or creator. This is the individual that creates the trust and transfers assets typically into the trust. Other individuals could also transfer assets into a trust that's created by the creator or grantor. The next individual is the trustee. The trustee manages the assets in accordance with the terms of the trust and also distributes those assets in accordance with the terms of the trust. The last category of individuals, uh, and it could be an entity as well, would be the beneficiaries. Now that's the job you want. You want to, and of course I'm teasing, but not teasing. You want to be the beneficiary of a trust. That's where the assets are distributed. And there are a couple of different types of beneficiaries. There's an income beneficiary, where you just get simple income from the trust, and there might be a remainder beneficiary who gets the money at a particular period in time, typically upon the death of the settler or creator or the grantor. So those are the individuals that are involved with a trust, but there are two basic types of trusts. One is a living trust, and that's a trust that's created while you're living, and it's effective right now. You sign it now, and it's effective now while you're living. That's a living trust. The other basic category of a trust is a testamentary trust, and that's a trust that's in a will. That's why I'm talking about wills right away, because we have living trusts and we have testamentary trusts that are contained in a will. And when we draft that trust within the will, we actually draft the whole entire trust. Instead of having a living trust that's effective right now, it's effective after death, after the will is probated, and the court says that that's a good document, the trust becomes effective. And the, so we have the living trust and the testamentary trust. And as I go along in this presentation, I'm gonna be talking about living trusts mostly, but sometimes you really want to have that trust within a will because you don't want assets to go directly to individuals. And I'll just give you a very simple example that I'll touch upon later, but you know, just simple. Let's say you have grandchildren and you want to give 10% of, of your estate to your grandchildren. So your last will and testament might say, you know, let's say you have three children. I give 30% to child A, 30% to child B, 
and 30% to child C, but 10% to my grandchildren equally. Now, the, the individual that creates this will doesn't want the grandchildren to get at age seven or 12 or even the age of majority, which is 18 years of age. Because the, the individual that's signing this will might feel that the grandchildren are simply too young to responsibly manage those assets and make sure that they're there for what's really important and not that, you know, as Prince used to say, that little red Corvette. Um, so you got to be careful. And so that's an example of why we would want to have a testamentary trust. And it goes hand in hand with your will. Um, one second, Ronald. You didn't go over the, um, the PowerPoint. So it's stay at the last will and treatment. Can you go down to the part? To, to the yes, the yes I'm, I'm actually still at the will. But don't worry, oh, Shane, I'm going well, to... So, okay, everybody I'm, was asking me to ask you to move through the slide. Okay, so you're yes. still in the first... I'm still slide. on the will, and I'm emphasizing the importance of thinking about a will real carefully, and just so that individuals know you don't have to give outright when you're doing your will. There are lots of reasons. If you look at the fourth uh, bullet point there, the will in the will, you could create a supplemental needs trust, or SNT. You could have a trust for the grandchildren, as in the fourth uh, bullet point there. Uh, and that's very important. So the will could be simple, but it should be tailor-made to you. And oftentimes, the use of a trust within that will is absolutely essential. Now we switch to, to the trust. And okay. so Everybody's so excited to hear about it. That's why. Thank yeah, you. no, no, it's just because it's so important. I know so many people who do wills and it's just, you know, they don't think about having a trust in the will and you want to tailor that trust, yeah. you know, for a lot of reasons and we're going to get to it. Uh, okay. Anyway, so again, a trust is a legal document. It holds property for the beneficiary. And one of the big advantages of a trust is that it avoids probate. Uh, trusts are private documents, unlike a will, you know, when you have a will and it gets probated, well, it goes through the surrogate's court and it's a public document. That's why, you know, we're all a little bit, you know, we're all a little bit gossipy sometimes, I guess. And, you know, there's a book out that uh, has the, you know, wills of the rich and famous and a John Lennon's will and all of this. Very interesting. But do you want or does, would your clients want uh, a will that you know is out there for everyone a trust would avoid the probate and it is a private document and that's one of the things that i, I really do like about it there are also tax advantages for the individual that creates the will and beneficiaries and we're going to go through some of that later on okay so we know about the testamentary trust and the living trust. So now we're gonna be talking about uh, different types of living trusts. And the two basic types of living trusts would be a revocable living trust and an irrevocable living trust. Now the revoc revocable living trust uh, is there. And as the name says, you could revoke it, you could amend it, you could change it anytime you want and the trust is revocable. Now I'm gonna to switch to the irrevocable living trust. As the name implies, the trust is irrevocable. However, however, some irrevocable trusts are very important, very important for Medicaid planning and other reasons, estate tax planning. And many people are a little hesitant to actually use an irrevocable living trust because they don't like the way it sounds. You're locked in forever because it's irrevocable. I'm here to tell you, if that irrevocable trust is drafted a certain way, it's not so difficult to revoke even the irrevocable trust. It's a little more difficult, but it won't be that much more difficult. And you would need the consent of the trustee. 
but there are ways that we can ensure that that trust in 99, uh, even more percent of the times could be revoked if the individual wanted. And I'm saying this right up front because the irrevocable trust is so important and I don't want anybody to think that they're locked in forever if the trusted, if trust is drafted correctly and if you have a trustee that you, know, you trust and will do the right thing. Okay. Let's keep on this slide. There are certain types of trusts that we use for estate tax planning. Oftentimes, these trusts are called credit shelter trusts, where we're actually using up the credit. Currently in New York State, it's $5.74 million. The federal is a crazy number, 11.4 million a person. It will be halved in a few years at the end of 2025. But for some of the, our wealthier clients, we oftentimes use credit shelter trusts. We also use life insurance trusts. And these trusts are commonly called ILITs, I-L-I-Ts, Irrevocable Life Insurance Trusts. And this is a way to get that life insurance out of an individual's taxable estate. And many times we save millions of dollars for our clients with a simple trust, just getting the, the life insurance out of an individual or couple's uh, estate. The last bullet point, we do have supplemental needs trust or special needs trust. And that's a trust that protects assets for a disabled individual or an individual with, with special needs while at the same time letting them stay on governmental benefits such as SSI and Medicaid. So we could have this war chest for them, but they could still stay on benefits. And we're gonna be getting into that in some more depth. Now I just wanna talk about revocable trusts. So again, the two basic categories are living trusts and testamentary trusts. Then we have categories of uh, living trust, and one is the revocable living trust. Many people do this to avoid probate, privacy, you know, so they don't have to go through probate, but assets in a revocable trust for the grantor is available for Medicaid. But we still use revocable trusts in a Medicaid context, sometimes, to avoid recovery against an asset later on. Medicaid can recover only against the probatable assets of the applicant. So using a revocable trust in some instances might avoid recovery, but just know that the assets are available for uh, eligibility. So going in, when we apply for Medicaid benefits, any assets in a revocable trust are like assets for Medicaid purposes, just in the individual's name. But we use it sometimes in a planning context again to avoid recovery. Now, hopefully the term irrevocable trusts are not gonna be that scary to people because again, if the trust is drafted right, uh, and you have a trustee that you trust and you get to pick your trustee, uh, that trust can be revoked or modified. Uh, and in my career of, of 40 years and over 30 years doing Medicaid planning and elder law and special needs and estate planning, throughout all of these years that I've been doing this, hardly anybody has revoked an irrevocable trust, just on a couple of occasions. And we've done thousands of irrevocable trusts. They're that good and they work really, really well. So uh, on this slide, we're gonna be talking about the irrevocable Medicaid Asset Protection Trust or Preservation Trust. And the main purpose of this type of trust is to protect assets from creditors and to protect assets vis-a-vis -vis the Medicaid program. So the assets are out of the individual's name for Medicaid purposes. Um, 
the, the trust has to be irrevocable because again, if that's an irrevocable trust, Medicaid will say, well, it's your money. It's the grantor's money, the creator's money. So the trust has to be deemed on paper as irrevocable. The grantor, the individual who creates the trust, it's not good practice for that individual to be the trustee. However, a trustee can be a child, can be uh, a niece or a nephew, grandchild, a close family friend, anyone that you trust who will do the right thing. It's very important to note on that second bullet point, the third line down. And this is under a law called OBRA 93. It came out in 1993 and it changed everything with regard to Medicaid planning. But no principle of the trust can go to the grantor. So no principle of the trust can go to the grantor. And if it does, it actually taints the trust. And Medicaid will say that all of the assets in that trust are available. But just know that there are ways that the grantor can get money that's in the trust, but not directly from the trust to the grantor. Any principal or income that's distributed to the grantor is available for Medicaid, so you gotta be careful. But many people set up the trust so that they do get the income, but not the principal. And these are called income-only trusts, where no principal could go to the grantor, but we're protecting all of the, uh, no income could go, sorry, no principal goes to the grantor, the income goes to the grantor, not the principal, but we're protecting the entire principal. So for example, if we put a home into this irrevocable trust, the grantor will get all of the income if a room is rented out or if it's a two family, or they could live there. That's like an income interest. And that's what our clients want. They want to transfer typically their homes into this Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. They get all of the tax benefits, and it's wonderful. They get to live there for their entire lifetime. So that's very, very important. Uh, the, the next line down is a little esoteric. Uh, this is really meant, I guess, more for lawyers, but there's certain provisions that we don't put into these types of trusts that most attorneys do put in trust, but these provisions will not make these trusts good for Medicaid. And this is a, what we call a HEMS provision, where the trust says that the principal could be used for the individual's health, education, maintenance, and support. Or there's a five plus five power, which says that the 5% of the principal could go to the grantor. You can't do that. And we won't do that because that will taint the trust. Again, there are ways to get the principal to the grantor, to the, to the individual who creates the trust, but not directly from the trust. There are ways to do it that really do work. Okay. Now, there are so many advantages to the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. So let's go through the advantages. It's a completed transfer for Medicaid. So in other words, once assets are transferred or the home is transferred or the IBM stock is transferred or the brokerage account is transferred or bank account is transferred, it's out for Medicaid purposes. And that's great. Decision making is easier. It's efficient because you've named someone, you cherry pick someone, that trustee to manage the assets in the trust. If it's an income only trust, which is fine, you're still getting all of the income and the assets are protected, which is wonderful. The assets are also protected, not only from Medicaid, but if you would just give those assets to the children, sometimes they might have a creditor. Like an example, real life example in my office, individual dad gave about $400,000 to his daughter. His daughter was trustworthy. That wasn't the issue, but she got into a very, very bad car accident. 
And uh, she was deemed to be only about, I think it was about 10% liable. But that 10% was millions and millions of dollars because unfortunately an individual became a quadriplegic. And the upshot of it was that they sued you know, the daughter and all of dad's money was lost because there wasn't enough insurance to cover because it was millions and millions of dollars. Well, if those assets were held in an irrevocable Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, we would not have had that issue. Um, so it protects the assets from creditors, not only of the individual, but of the children or whoever you might want to transfer assets to. Now, look at the next bullet point. Look at the beauty of this. You still get all of your real estate tax exemptions. You know, let's say the home is in the trust all of your senior citizens exemption, the enhanced store. You also get the capital gains tax exclusion, which is $250,000 for an individual and $500,000 for a couple. So if that home is sold in a trust, and it, we do that all the time. You know, let's say mom sets up this trust and mom, the trust says mom could live in this trust for the rest of her life. And she's happy, happy, happy. And one day she says, you know what? This is too much house for me. I want to sell this. So the trustee sells it. You get all of the tax uh, benefits from A to Z. It's wonderful. It's out for Medicaid. But in a sense, we, we ride the line here. The home is in for all of the tax benefits. So we have to draft this trust very, very carefully so that it works for Medicaid, but it also works and protects you with regard to the tax issues. The next benefit is huge, huge. At the time of death, there's a basis step up. So here's the example. Mom transfers the home into this trust. Home was, was bought many years ago for a small amount of money. Mom passes away, home is still in the trust, the children or whoever the beneficiaries are get that home with a basis that's moved up, not for what mom paid for it, the 20,000 or 50,000, moved up to the market value at the time of death, even if it's a million dollars, even if it's two million, whatever it might be. How good is that? And that really is wonderful. Now. The last bullet point is very important. In our irrevocable Medicaid trusts, and we really pride ourselves on our, our trusts, we have what's known as a uh, limited power of appointment that's reserved. And this is a power of appointment that lets the set law move around who the beneficiary is, could be amongst the children and grandchildren, without changing the trust at all. So, uh, and we recently used this because a child who wasn't doing well physically became full-fledged, had a full-fledged disability and wanted an SNT, a special needs trust. We didn't have to modify this trust. We just exercised this power of appointment and created, changed the beneficiary to this SNT. How simple is that? And the assets are still out for Medicaid. So how good is that? Uh, there are some disadvantages. The individual that creates the trust doesn't manage the assets. So there's a bit of a loss of control. But again, who actually picks the trustee? That's the set law, the creator. And typically that's a friendly trustee that you really trust. So not as much of a loss of control as you might think. Uh, creating the trust is more complicated and it's definitely more costly, but for that one-time fee to set it up for your entire lifetime to protect all of the assets that you've earned, it really uh, is worth it. It's a one-time fee, a little more complicated, but you know what? It's not that complicated after all, uh, but it's you know not as easy as just transferring assets out to children, but you run the risk of so many issues happening later on. One issue that you really should look at is 
it is difficult to mortgage real estate that's held in the irrevocable Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. You can get a reverse mortgage if you need it, but it is harder to mortgage that real estate. So you do have to be careful if that's a consideration. Uh, the fourth bullet point, you want to think about who's going to get the income. Is the settler going to, excuse me, get that income? Is that what uh, he or she wants or they want? Or maybe the income should go to the children. Let's say they have enough of their own income. So that's what we would do as the attorneys to basically ascertain uh, what, what to do, how much income goes to the individual, maybe all of it, maybe none, none of it. Okay, so you want to think about that. But one thing you have to be very, very careful about, you don't want to let that trust income just stay in the trust because the law says at a very, very low level, I think it's only a little over $12,000 that when income comes into that trust, you're at the highest federal rate very, very quickly. So you want the income to be dispersed to someone so somebody else other than the trust would pay the taxes on it. Okay. Now, I've alluded to this and spoke about it a little bit today, but whether it's a testamentary trust or a living trust, whether that living trust is a revocable trust, or even if it's the Medicaid irrevocable asset protection trust, if there is a beneficiary that has a special need. You want to typically set up a special needs trust uh, for that beneficiary. Now, let's just step back for a moment when we talk about special needs trusts. There are two different types, and that we're going to talk about on the next slide as well, but there are two different types of special needs trust, one in which a third party provides the asset for another individual, and the other is for the individual himself or herself. So a third party special needs trust is that special needs trust that's, you know, where the money is given for another individual, such as in the testamentary trust for another individual. But if it's that individual is got some money in or an inheritance or a windfall from a a lawsuit, he or she can create a first party supplemental needs trust for themselves, and the rules are very, very different. So a special needs trust, as I mentioned before, is a trust that allows someone who's getting benefits, such as SSI and Medicaid, lets them keep those benefits and lets that individual or lets the trustee provide for that individual to provide for extras. So if we're doing an SNT for a disabled child, uh, you know, that disabled child, you know, has maybe in a group home and SSI and Medicaid and, but let's say that child wants to go or grandchild wants to go to summer camp or you feel that that's a good thing to do uh, for an individual with those disabilities, uh, that's where we get into the assets in that supplemental needs trust, and those assets can be used for the individual. Usually payments out of a supplemental or special needs trust are in-kind payments. What does that mean? It means that the trust itself will actually pay for what the disabled individual wants or needs. So for example, uh, if uh, the individual needs uh, a mattress, and I was going to say go to Sleepy's, I think there's a new name, Mattress Firm. So you go to Mattress Firm, and instead of just giving the disabled individual the money to buy the mattress, through the Supplemental Needs Trust, the trustee of the trust will go and purchase the mattress, and that's called an in-kind payment. And that's typically how the money is used in the trust. So again, the special needs trust or supplemental needs trust to supplement the needs of an individual that has special needs, but so they still could remain on 
and get all of the advantages of these benefits. Now, there's nothing wrong with it. And in fact, these special needs provisions are actually codified. It's in the law. It's in the general obligations law in New York State. They want you to use it. Public policy want you to use it. They want people to be taken care of. So if someone is on Medicaid, the government not only lets you do it, they lay it out for you. It's right there in black and white, and they say it's okay and it's fine to do. Okay, now this slide talks about the first and third party special needs uh, trust. So the first party is with an individual's own money. And there is, if you see that first line that's slightly shaded in, in light blue, my favorite color, by the way, um, that's the first party trust for an individual. So let's say an individual is under the age of 65. There is an under 65, what we call payback trust. So when is this typically used? Well, let's say an individual is, is, has a disability and there was some negligence and there's a lawsuit brought and the individual gets, let's say $500,000. You put that $500,000 in the individual's name and they'll be slightly over the SSI asset level of only $2,000. By the way, the Medicaid level is 15,000 in New York State, $15,450. But we're talking about someone under the age of 65 with a disability, SSI uh, level is $2,000. So there's a windfall of $500,000. That individual, if there's capacity, or a parent, grandparent, guardian, or the court can create this under 65 payback trust. So that $500,000 could go into a trust that we would draft. Money goes into this trust and it sits there and it's used for the individual's supplemental needs. So they could stay on benefits and they're used throughout the individual's lifetime. Upon death, because they let you make these assets be unavailable for Medicaid and available for the special needs, upon death, Medicaid will be paid back for the monies that they spent, if there are any uh, assets left, or I should say up to the available assets remaining in the trust. And when Medicaid is paid off, if there's anything left over, the assets go to whoever your beneficiaries are. And that's the first party special needs trust or the under 65 Medicaid payback trust. The th third party trust is that SNT, that special needs trust in the will. Or let's say mom has a disabled child and in that irrevocable or revocable trust, you know, we'll create that SNT for someone with special needs, a child with special needs, et cetera. And that's a third party trust. And the third party trust is not a payback trust. Uh, it's there for the individual. When the individual dies, Medicaid does not seek it. The money never hit that individual, like with the, un with the under 65 trust. Third party created it. And upon death of that disabled child, the assets go wherever the individual who created that third party trust want the assets to go. Maybe the other children, maybe the grandchildren, maybe to whoever, charity, whatever, doesn't matter. But there is no payback with the third party supplemental or special needs trust. Now, before I get to the next slides, uh, you know, and I do want to talk about some of these other things that are in the, the, the slides and the powers of attorneys and these other documents. Uh, I do want to talk about some of the reasons why we create these trusts. I know I went into some of them, but not all of them. So we do this for individuals, trusts for individuals with special needs. Uh, the example I gave with grandchildren. So they don't get the assets at age 18. Uh, maybe the assets are divided so that uh, the money at age 18 or whenever, however old they are, you know, these assets are held in a third-party trust, let's say for grandchildren or anybody who's a minor, 
or not even a minor, but youngish adults who may not handle money well. So you might put assets in this trust and say that there's a trustee that you named. The assets can be used for the individual, for the individual's health, education, maintenance, and support. But at age 20, let's say 21, could be any age, they get a third of the assets outright. And if that's too young, make it 25. But in my example, a third outright at 21. The rest, you know, can't be used or abused. It's held by the trustee for the individual. Can be used for the health, education, maintenance, and support. But then, assume a third goes uh, to the individual at age 21, let's say a third at age 25, and a third at age 30. So the individual can mature into knowing how to manage those assets and learning how to protect those assets for the future and not using those assets right away. Uh, we've had some individuals that came to me and said, my son doesn't have a disability, but boy, he can, you know, I'm really worried about this, you know. So we're gonna make those ages higher, 35, 40, 45, whatever it is, make it an appropriate age for the individual. Um, Ronald, do you wanna take one question right now? Or? Okay. So, um, take a question. Okay, so, um, and then, and Alyssa, I'm sorry if I don't pronounce your name correct, I'm gonna allow you just to ask your question. Just one second, let me just allow you. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I could hear you well. No, um, um, uh, yes, uh, Anna, can you, you can ask your question. Hello, okay, so maybe she can, let me just read the question for you, um, one second. So she asks, um, are there any benefit for a disabled individual under 65 to establish a first party special need trust over an uh, uh, ABLE account? I'm sorry, uh, to establish that trust what? I didn't hear the best. Um, to establish a first party special needs trust over an uh, ABLE account? A -B -L -E. Okay, over an ABLE account. Well, look, uh, you know, these first party trusts are typically there for a windfall. You know, with the, the ABLE accounts and there's, uh, uh, you know, they're talking about legislation to increase the level on these ABLE accounts to well over the 100,000. They're even talking about raising the limit to $520,000 on the ABLE accounts. Uh, but right now they're limited. And uh, you know, let's say there's a windfall from an inheritance or a, a, a lawsuit, uh, and the individual really wants to stay on Medicaid, you know, and get these benefits so that this windfall could be used to supplement their needs over the rest of their lifetime. It is a way to have this money stretch out and last for a long period of time. Right now, ABLE accounts are, are limited to, you know, the hundred thousand dollar level. Um, um, I'm just gonna take one more question. Um, Gail asks, why would someone create a first party trust and give back to Medicaid? Okay, they're gonna create the first party trust for the reason I just said in that last question, you know, when there's a windfall. Uh, and the only way these trusts work, if the individual wants to stay on Medicaid, is to give back to Medicaid later on. So when a client comes into my office, we do, uh, uh, Gail, we do a uh, cost benefit analysis. We try to figure out, is it better to do an under 65 payback trust, first party payback trust, or is it better to do something else? You know, for some of these individuals who have capacity, they may actually get off benefits and say, no, no, you know, I'm not using, the, I don't need the benefits that much. I just really want this money. So we really figure out, and we actually, I, I'm also a financial advisor with my son, and we, we actually go through this very, very carefully and figure out the income and the expenses of this individual and what they're likely gonna be, and we do that cost-benefit analysis and figure out, is that the right thing to do? Um, great. Um, 
So one more question. Is there is a windfall why not establish third party asset trust? If there is a windfall, why not establish a third party asset trust? Uh, because it's it's not a windfall. Medicaid gets pa- Medicaid gets paid back upon the death of the individual. But let's say that individual will likely use up most of the assets uh, in that first party trust. You know, so why not do this? Let the individual stay on Medicaid, and let that money that's in that first party trust be used to supplement the needs. Uh, you know, over the lifetime. If that money in that first party trust won't be used at all or very little, maybe it doesn't make sense to set that up. There's another way to do it. Uh, so we have to do a cost benefit analysis based on the needs of the individual. And Gail, I hope that answers your question. Yes, um, maybe I uh, will answer the other question in a few minutes. Can you finish the PowerPoint and then we'll go back to the questions? Sure, okay. okay. So, uh, sure. So this is first and third party trust. Now, what's another reason to set up a trust? Let's say there's a child uh, who we call a spendthrift. That's a child who can hold on to money. You know, you give a daughter a dollar and she's going to spend $10, can hold on to it. And you want that money to help her and to last and use it for, you want her or him to use the assets that they may inherit Uh, through a will or through a trust to last and to be used for important things, not just frivolous things. So we could set up a a spendthrift trust so that the assets could be held within either a testamentary or living trust, whether revocable or irrevocable, and dole out the money over a period of time while still having those funds be used for any emergencies that might crop up where the trustee feels that there's a real need and the, those monies could be used. Now, I, a part of the rest of the slides are about advanced directives. And they're just so important. I know the focus is on trusts. We spoke about wills. Just wanna make sure that everyone knows here, you should have a power of attorney. You wanna cherry pick and name someone that you trust to be your agent on that power of attorney to make sure that they will stand in your shoes and handle your financial affairs and even do the planning that you need to do. If that power of attorney is expanded and has all of the provisions that are needed. So one of the things I just wanna emphasize, make sure that an elder law attorney that's experienced will draft that power of attorney. Could be me, it could be anybody else with lots of experience because if you're missing some of the extra provisions, that could hinder everything upon incapacity. So that power of uh, of attorney is there where you, in advance, that's why it's called an advanced directive, in advance, appoint an agent to handle your financial affairs, but we expand that power for planning purposes to include so many other things. And even if we're doing a home care Medicaid application and we need to do a pooled income trust, we need a special trust provision for us to do the pooled income trust. So for most individuals, we won't, you know, the the home care application won't make as much sense with with just a standard power of attorney. You won't get this on LegalZoom. Don't do it on your own see a qualified elder law attorney such as myself who's been doing this, who knows these issues. We may add anywhere from 12 to 15 to 80 extra provisions to the power, and that's important. In the slide, you'll see you can revoke the power of attorney, and who's gonna, uh, who, who could you, uh, how do you revoke it? It's with a revocation of the power that's given to the agent and given to every institution so they're on notice that the agent on the power of attorney that you originally named can't act. Uh, But think about it in advance as well as you can. So you name the right individual that you trust, shouldn't say with your life, but that, that you trust with all of your assets. Now, on the last bullet point here, you'll see that if you don't have a good power of attorney, 
we may, we may need to go in for a guardianship action at the time uh, of incapacity, unfortunately. And that's costly. It's time consuming. You have to pay the attorney. You have to pay the court appointed attorney. You have to pay a court evaluator, uh, et cetera. Uh, you know, and that's something that, you know, is right for some people if they don't have anyone that they could comfortably name on the power of attorney. Uh, so you do have to be careful. Uh, capacity, well, why do we have advanced directives? Because God forbid if there's incapacity at some point in life, uh, then you can't sign the power of attorney. You can't sign a will. You can't sign the trust. You can't sign the healthcare proxy. So you wanna do these documents in advance. And different documents have a different level of capacity. You want to make sure for Medicaid purposes that there's gifting powers in that power of attorney. And there's a separate rider attached to that power of attorney also with its separate list of additional items, anywhere from maybe 15 to 80 different uh, additions to that statutory gifts rider that's attached to the power of attorney. And that's something which should be done as well. So with that, uh, uh, gifting power, we could do what we need. Um, without the gifting power, the agent can only gift $500 per year. And that's nothing when we're talking about Medicaid and Medicaid planning and transferring assets into a Medicaid trust, et cetera, or doing estate tax planning. You really do need that gifting provision, but that circles back to what I said a couple of times. You want to name someone that you absolutely trust as agent on the power of attorney. Uh, and by the way, uh, just as a check and balance is, you know, you can actually name two individuals on that power of attorney and say that in order to do anything on that power, they both must act. You could also do that with three individuals on the power, but then it gets a little murky and you know you name three children to do something, uh, but they all have to agree, and then nobody agrees, and you're stuck. So you have to be careful with that. But you can say that in the power of attorney as a check and balance. And the statutory gift rider is very important because gifting is extremely limited without it. Power to make gifts also include the power to transfer assets to a Medicaid trust, and sometimes even to change the beneficiaries on certain accounts, such as IRAs, et cetera. Okay, this talks about the importance of the statutory gift rider. We're really stuck without it if we're gonna be trying to do Medicaid planning in the future, and even estate tax planning, and of course, I said that you need an attorney for all those other documents. You really do. And you need an attorney to guide and be the quarterback of a plan. However, with the healthcare proxy, it's a simple document. You could download it from the DOH website. You could just Google statutory healthcare proxy in New York State, and you're gonna get that form. And it's a great form. It's simple. You don't need a lawyer for it. Um, uh, you do wanna say, in the optional instruction you know, part of it, that your agent knows your wishes about feeding tubes, artificial nutrition and hydration, and that you have, given the, you have given them the authority to make those decisions. Uh, and that's really important. And on the healthcare proxy, there are places where you can provide for organ donations. Now you don't wanna turn the healthcare proxy into a living will. The healthcare proxy is an appointing document. The power of attorney is an appointing document where you appoint someone else with regard to the power of attorney to make your financial decisions, to do the planning, to set up a trust if you have all these extra provisions in it, uh, et cetera. It's an appointing document vis-a-vis -vis the healthcare proxy where you appoint somebody to make your healthcare wishes you know, when you can't. If you could make your wishes, you will. Even if you're, in, you're uh, disabled, 
As long as your mind is there and you could make your own decisions, that's fine. You have the capacity, but when you lack that capacity, at least you've named someone that you trust to make the decisions that you want. Now, how would the agent on that power of attorney or the successor agent know what your wishes are? Well, number one, you tell them, you talk to them in detail about what you would want. And you could also have a writing, and that writing is called the living will. Living will is where you set forth what your healthcare wishes are. Uh, you don't want to be kept alive artificially if there's no chance of recovery, or you do want to be kept alive artificially, you know, and might sign up for cryogenics, as a client of mine recently did, you know, where he wants to be frozen at the time of death and see what happens. Yes, you're hedging your bets. It's expensive, but this is what he decided to do. If you don't have a good power of attorney for financial reasons or a good healthcare proxy, you know, where you appoint somebody to make your healthcare decisions, then we may need to go in for a guardianship at the time uh, the individual loses com uh, capacity. But again, the big drawbacks are that it's extremely time consuming, costs money, uh, and there's an emotional to uh, a toll on the individual because you know, if they can, they will go to court. Even sometimes we've seen individuals with a little bit of dementia go to court and it's confusing and it's hard on the family members. When do we want a guardianship action in there? Well, if there's nobody that the individual could comf comfortably name on the power of attorney, then you know we would wanna go in for a guardianship and make sure that a court oversees everything and make sure that there's an annual accounting that accounts for every single penny that goes in and goes out every single year. Maybe we want that you know, for some individuals, although again, it's costly, it's time consuming, there's a bit of a toll on the family, but sometimes it could be the right thing to do. So I know that I was supposed to lecture till about now. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, if that's okay. Yes, um, we have a few questions. Um, Richard asks, does it make sense to sell a property prior to establish an irrevocable trust? Uh, it, uh, it might, but typically it doesn't. Uh, the way we set up that trust, the asset could go into the trust. The Medicaid time starts to run for Medicaid nursing home care. Uh, I hope you know that there's no look back for Medicaid home care in New York State. But once the assets are in that irrevocable trust, the time does start to, start to tick uh, for that five-year look back. And the asset in that trust could be sold by the trustee of the trust at any point in time. Okay. Um, the next one, it's for Mark. Can a uh, irrevocable trust be revoked with, without a court proceeding after the grantor has died? No. When the grantor has died, that trust becomes truly an irrevocable trust. Because the law says the only way you could revoke a trust is with the consent of the grantor, the trustee, and all of the beneficiaries. But we draft our trust in such a way so that you're only really going to need the consent of the trustee. But if that grantor is, is gone, that trust is irrevocable. Okay, um, next question um, is from Melissa. Can you answer if gifting can occur before a person qualifies for Medicaid? Yes, gifting can be done right before, in the month even, before eligibility for Medicaid home care to get a home health attendant, for example, right away. But if you're looking for nursing home care, the individual or the individual spouse is subject to a five-year look back, and that's something that we have to consider. And by the way, one thing that I should have mentioned and I did not, is that you don't want to put retirement accounts such as an IRA into a, a, a trust, because once you change that ownership, Uncle Sam is going to want to take their share. And retirement accounts is something that I changed. Uh, with a, a case that we had in Queens uh, maybe 13, 15 years ago, IRAs and retirement accounts in payout status 
for Medicaid are exempt. So make sure that you don't transfer ownership of those types of accounts into a trust. Okay. Um, um, and Alyssa asked another question. It's a long one, so I'm going to try to read it. Um, so she explains, so in the last will, can a person simply state, when I die, I want X people to receive this percentage of money, or do they need to spell it out, I want X person to be the beneficiary of the money from my trust, checking account, investment, etc.? I think I got the question. I mean, okay. you, you could do it generally, or you could say specific accounts, uh, and I think that's the question. Yeah. Uh, the danger to doing specific accounts is you get a better interest rate in another bank, and then you change that account, and all of a sudden, you got to go back to me to redo the will. So it's better not to name specific accounts. I probably would do something uh, different and uh, make it more general so you don't have to come in and redo the will or trust or use that power of appointment so often. Okay, um, I think I she asked another question. Uh, and then we answered that already. Um, yeah, I think um, Ron mentioned that it's a five year look back when we apply for nursing home, not for home care, right? Yes, that's correct. So yeah. for example, uh, if in June, 2019, uh, an individual who has 115,000 transfers 100,000 to a Medicaid trust has 15,000 as of July 1. Uh, as of July 1, they're going to be financially eligible for Medicaid home care to get a home health attendant. That could be 200,000, et cetera. Uh, but not so for nursing home care. So that is correct. Yes. Um, anybody else who has a question, if it's long, I can't allow you to um, ask the question. I think, um, and Alyssa, you have a last, your question, because I'm not really, I can't really read it. Um, if you want, I can allow you to ask the question. If anybody else wants to do that too, I can do it. <clears throat> so that'll be easier because I, when reading the question, maybe I can, um, that's not really what you wanted to say. So it'd be easier if you ask it directly. Um, but, um, again, the PowerPoint, I, if you need the power, if you want the PowerPoint, please email me directly because it will be easier for me to know who wants it. Um, and then I can remember. Um, so my email is S J A C Q U E S at P S S, um, USA.org. Um, and they'll ask, does one trust it? trustee at least have to be a, a U.S. resident? Uh, you know, it, it, it is better to have a U.S. resident as a trustee, uh, but it's not absolutely essential, but it's, it's what we would typically want to see. Okay. But they, they can have somebody outside of U.S. to be a trustee, that you meant, right? You, you, you could. Okay, you could. Okay. Um, okay, great, Annalisa. I have all your questions. I'm not sure why we couldn't do the audio neither, um, but I'm glad that we answered all your questions. Um, Mary asks, the incomes of the pension, can these be allocated to the third-party trust you mentioned? Uh, the, uh, the income of the pensions... Yeah, uh, sure, of course. You could fund the third-party trust with any, you, you can't do it in advance. You can't assign over an entire pension to, to uh, a, a third-party trust. But as the income comes in, sure, you could just add to that third-party trust anytime you want. Okay. Um, and Richard asks, as a POA, can I appoint another family member to be a backup POA? Uh, I think yes, of course. You, you want a backup power of attorney. So there are a couple of ways to do it. You can name more than one uh, to act simultaneously, either together or separately, or you could have successor powers of attorneys. It could be child A, but if that child can't act or dies, then child B. And if that person can't act or also dies, then individual C doesn't have to be uh, a, a child, could be anybody who's over 18. 
Okay. Um, for the copy of the audio, I do not have that, but you will, it will be up our website, pssusa.org. It will be up the, web, up the website. So we usually have a, um, the, part, the presentation that you can, if you miss something, you can see it again. But um, we can, I don't think we can send you the audio, but it will be up the, web, the website. Um, and another question, um, will this be, and, and will this be excluded for Medicaid extraction? I guess the last question we just answered, you just answered, can it be excluded for Medicaid extraction? I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know what the question means. Okay, okay. One second. Could what be excluded? Oh, the income, the income from the pension. Oh, uh, uh, it, it depends. Well, you mean in a third party trust? What type of trust? I don't have enough information. Okay, so Mary, I think, asks, uh, wait, let me go back. Oh, the income from the, so Pension, yes. the income from pensions. Well, if you add it to the third party trust, they just become part of the trust uh, and it become part of the principle of the trust, uh, you know, in a third party trust. You know, in other words, if it's a pension that just comes in every month, the trust, there's no principle that, that the trust is not holding that pension. Just as the income comes in, you would have to actually put that into the third party trust, or if it's a Medicaid trust into the Medicaid trust, but if it's a Medicaid trust, you wanna be careful because uh, every time you transfer money into trust every month, if it's gonna be a nursing home situation, not a home care, nursing home situation, you know, Medicaid will look five years back, will include all of these transfers into that trust. Okay, uh, Mary, um, can I, maybe I'm gonna ask you to, I'm gonna allow you to ask the question again if I missed something. Let me just um, allow you to say it, one second. And I just want your question to be answered the way you want it to, because maybe we're missing in the one part, Mary. Okay. Can you hear me, Mary? Hmm. Yes, I can. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Hello? Mary. Okay. So I guess we answered her question. I wanted to make sure that's what she wanted to ask that, um, exactly. Um, one more question. Uh, Ronald, you know, you always have a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. um, one more question is, um, did you say that distribution from our, our IRA are exempt for Medicaid purposes? So, so can, they, can the money be kept by the person receiving Medicaid benefit? Okay, uh, no. So uh, what I did say, though, that IRAs and retirement accounts in payout status are exempt for Medicaid purposes. However, Medicaid will budget the distributions. So if you're 70 and a half, you have to take mandatory required distributions. Uh, and actually that age might be bumped up to 72 soon in a pending potential uh, legislation. But right now it's 70 and a half. You have to take those distributions. Uh, Medi although the asset, the IRA is exempt for Medicaid, the required distributions are budgeted for Medicaid purposes like income, such as you know, pension income will be, uh, um, Social Security will be, just like that. Okay. Um, Richard Lovell, Lobel, um, can I ask, I'm gonna allow you to ask your question maybe because he said we, um, he wants to, I'm gonna allow you to ask your question, okay? Please let me know. Richard. Yes, hi, do you hear me? Yes, yeah, I can hear you, yes. Oh, okay, that's how it works. Okay, so um, actually, Ronald, I've already uh, met with Debbie in your office, uh, uh, and uh, my question is this. Um, 
I, both my brother and I are POA. My brother has pretty much excluded himself from any responsibility whatsoever. My mother, my, both my parents have been living with me. My father passed away years ago. My mother still lives with myself and my wife. Um, and my brother has not been heard of, basically, for almost three years. So it really falls or something. Um, Richard, we cannot hear you. Can you try one more time? Maybe are you talking on the phone or the or com computer? I would like. <laughs> because this question yes. is very long. Hear yes, me, I can hear you. Hear me at all? Yes, I can't hear you now. What? Oops. Uh, Richard, you keep going in and out, but yes. I, I, I get your question. So uh, we, we have an IRA that we drafted for uh, uh, mom. Uh, the agents are you and your brother, but your brother's not that involved. And you live with your wife and you like your wife and maybe one or two of your adult sons to be a power of attorney as well. Can that be done legally? Oh, okay. uh, and the answer is... Uh, it, it can be, but mom has to sign, your mother has to sign uh, another power of attorney to permit that um, because it's, it's her money. Now, it's possible to use a provision in that power, uh, you know, where you could assign the right to someone else. It's yeah. not without some issues. So I really would like a, another power to be signed in that situation. Although if you look at the power of attorney really carefully, there is a, a power there that lets you assign the powers, but uh, you know, it's, it's rife for someone to come in and, and uh, look at that and, and have some issues. Um, so the best way to do it, if there is capacity to have mom come in and, and, and sign another power. Okay. So you can see the question, right, Manu? Yes. Okay, great, <laughs> great, great. Um, if you go back, if you go down, you can see Patricia's question. Patricia Sullivan. Yes. Okay. So uh, she asks, when you speak of a five-year look back, is that five years before the trust is created or five years before the person applies for benefits? Um, okay. So Medicaid looks back when an individual, and it's only for nursing home care, when an individual is in a nursing home, the assets are down to the Medicaid levels and the individual applies for benefits. And then the five-year look back starts. So the individual has to actually be in the nursing home already, get their assets down and an application is in there. Then the five-year look back starts and then they look to see what assets were gifted or transferred for nursing home care. Again, we don't have the look back for Medicaid home care. And Mary Lowe asks the last, the last, I think it's the last question. Okay, so Mary asks, let's see, if you are not retired or have at least another 10 years before retirement, does it make sense to initially start with a revocable trust and then switch to an irrevocable trust later on? Uh, well, <laughs> let me put it like this. Uh, it depends. Uh, depends on a lot of factors. So Mary, if somebody has great long-term care insurance, maybe a, a revocable trust is all you need. But if somebody doesn't have uh, good long-term care insurance uh, and you, know, you say, well, I'm gonna work for another five years, 10 years, you just don't know what's going to happen in the future. So we want to take an educated guess. So if someone is 70 years old, 55 years old, 80 years old, we probably want to do the planning now because we're not God. We can't read the future and we don't know when we might need nursing home care or any other type of care. Um, so we want to do the planning in advance, not at the last minute. So just doing a revocable trust and then quote unquote, you don't switch to an irrevocable, 
actually revoke the revocable trust and then restart everything is probably not the best idea, but it depends on the circumstances. Yes. Um, um, we will end it in about um, another five minutes. Um, I think there's two more questions that we asked. Uh, the first two, the last two questions from the anonymous attendee. Can okay. you? Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. Will the trust affect the trustee's taxes or the ability for the trustee to obtain scholarships for the trustee's kids? Very good question. So if that is an issue, well, first of all, 99% of the times it will not affect anything. Being a trustee is just, you're managing the assets of someone else's you know, trust and someone else's money. So it's not your money unless the trust says it is your money. So how could that be an issue? Well, if the trust says that you as trustee are getting all the income, well, that could affect scholarships. Uh, but the typical trust doesn't say that, and all the trust, all, all the, the attorney has to do is make sure that if that's an issue, that trustee does not get any income. And typically, that trustee doesn't get any income anyway. Okay, and we do have one last question. Mm -hmm. it, if gifting is not in the power of attorney and the principal is now incapacitated, does that preclude setting up a trust? Uh, yeah, you, because you, you need a trust provision as well and a gifting provision to get assets into that trust. So yeah, we probably would just have to go in for a guardianship action. And this really, this question, and it's a great question, emphasizes the importance of advanced planning and having all of these documents in place. Because you never know. You never know in life when something will happen. And I think we've all learned that lesson at least some points in our lifetimes. Okay, um, great. So any, any additional questions, um, well, can you please directly um, send it directly to Ron? Um, do you have any information? Can you go back up to your first page, um, first slide, Ron, that can have the website? Sure. Let me see it, okay. Oh, uh, let's see. Yeah, so the um, the website. Oops, the yep. website. It's um, www.fatulalaw.com. Or if you have any question, you wanna uh, speak to somebody, to a lawyer, or to one, you can call the number. It's two one two seven five one seven six zero zero. Because I know some people are over on the phone too; they cannot see the slide. Um, so the number is two one two seven five one seven six hundred. Um, it can you, you can send me an email that I can know who wants the PowerPoint. Again, my email is sjacques at pssusa.org. And if you have any question about our PSS services, please, or if you know anybody that's caring for a loved one who needs um, um, services, and please reach out to me. My number is 917-734-9292. And also you can send me an email. Um, thank you again, everyone. Thank you again, Ronald. That was amazing. Uh, oh, was definitely my thing. pleasure. Thank you so much. And um, if and I think this one is easier too for a lot of caregiver that's not that cannot do it in a person, but they a lot, they can do a webinar and then they have the information. So we can um, set up another one if possible. That um, maybe another um, topic that people will be benefit. Um, it will be beneficial for for everybody else. Okay, um, the webinar will be up the website. Thank you again, and have a um, great day, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ronald. Bye bye now. Bye.